the National Health Service of England has a published evidence-based treatment algorithm for multiple sclerosis with disease-modifying therapies. What drug should you use in what situation? This is created by experts for clinicians, but is it any good? Today I'll offer my critique as an American neurologist, but keep in mind a lot of the authors have more academic clout than I do, and everyone has their own opinion. But remember what Mark Twain said, if you have no will to change it, you have no right to criticize it. Now if you want to check out the treatment algorithm yourself, it's available in a link in the description below. It's published available to everyone. Here are the main authors, and you may recognize a few of the names. To the right is Professor Gavin Giovanoni, who has has a very popular research blog and is active on Twitter. And also neuropharmacist Ray Dorsey, also very active on Twitter. And I can tell you, they may not actually agree with all of the recommendations here. So this algorithm may be somewhat of a compromise. And what I mean by that is, for instance, Professor Giovanoni, I don't want to put words in his mouth, has multiple times advocated for early aggressive treatment, even in people who have relatively low disability, because of the challenge of truly prognosticating who's going to get into trouble later on. Again, I shouldn't put words in his mouth, but I suspect he would not necessarily agree with a lot of the recommendations made here. Now, I'm going to start with some definitions they use in their later recommendations. The first is a clinically significant relapse. This is any motor relapse, in other words, any attack causing weakness of muscles, any brainstem relapse, this is an attack causing symptoms related to injury to the brainstem, such as vertigo, double vision, speaking or swallowing difficulty. A sensory relapse can be very mild, but if it leads to functional impairment, some people can have imbalance because they can't feel where their feet are in space, or they have difficulty using their hands because their hands are too numb, that would count as a clinically significant relapse. A relapse leading to sphincter dysfunction, such as difficulty with the bowels or bladder control or straining to urinate. Optic neuritis, pain and vision loss in one of the eyes. And optic neuritis can be very mild. It can resolve spontaneously to 20-20 vision in five days with no steroids, but it's still considered a clinically significant relapse or intrusive pain lasting more than 48 hours. So I think this is kind of a pointless definition. They probably should just say relapse because this would include virtually any attack except maybe mild numbness not considered to be functionally impairment, which, which is somewhat subjective. So probably they should have just used the term relapse. They go on to define a disabling relapse. This is a relapse that affects the patient's social life or occupation, is otherwise considered disabling by the patient, or affects their activities of daily living. This would be things like preparing food or shopping or managing finances. So it would have to be quite significant to affect the activities of daily living or ADLs. If it affects motor or sensory function sufficient to impair the capacity or reserve to care for themselves or others, or if it needs treatment or hospitalization. So if you get hospitalized or you need IV steroids, then it's a disabling relapse. So this is a little bit more significant. They also talk about highly active disease, and this is defined as one attack in the previous year and MRI activity, either new T2 or gadolinium enhancing lesions or an enlarging T2 lesion. And they talk about rapidly evolving severe disease, that's relapsing remitting, and this is two or more disabling relapses in one year and one or more gadolinium enhancing lesions on MRI brain, or a significant increase in T2 lesion load compared to the prior MRI. Now, I have to say in general, I'm against this sort of algorithmic thinking. I understand they have to create a guideline, but there are just so many variabilities. For instance, if I had a patient who had a severe myelopathic relapse and was in a wheelchair for six months, I would be more concerned about them than someone who had two minor but disabling relapses such as optic neuritis or a sensory relapse from which they recovered 
quickly. Also, I'm not sure why they focus on the MRI of the brain. If someone has new lesions in the spine, that's very significant. And I'm not sure why the obsession with gadolinium enhancing lesions. If someone had a large new T2 lesion, you know, that was not enhancing just because I had not scanned them at exactly the right time, I would consider that to be just as significant. So I understand they have to create some kind of guideline here, but it's a little bit arbitrary. I do think there are just too many subjective factors to create an algorithm and give recommendations just based on that. Next, we move to the criteria for starting, stopping, and changing disease-modifying therapies. So these are the criteria the NHS proposes for starting medication. So they suggest you should have an expanded disability status scale, or EDSS, less than seven, unless in the midst of a relapse. So EDSS is a scale used for disability in MS research. Zero is no disability. Six means a cane is required to walk 100 meters. 6.5 means that a walker is required. And seven means that a wheelchair is required except for very short distances. So essentially, this is saying if you're using a wheelchair and you can't walk, you should not take medication. Now, there is evidence that disease-modifying therapies are more effective in people with less disability, and it's also true that in someone who has significant spinal cord injury, certain types of disease-modifying therapies may be riskier. There may be a greater risk of urinary tract infection, pneumonia, that kind of thing. However, I would not agree with not using medication in anyone with an EDSS greater than 7, in particular because there are definitely people who have active relapsing MS or other otherwise have signs of active inflammation or relatively young or who could definitely benefit from these medications. So I think it's really difficult to exclude people and you may be excluding people who could significantly benefit from the medications. After all, preserving upper extremity function is quite significant. And people who have more disability, a small change is a very big deal to them. If you use a wheelchair but you're able to transfer, you're able to use your hands well, every Every little bit of function you have is very, very significant to the use. So I wouldn't really agree with that. The other thing they mentioned, now they do say unless in the midst of a relapse, which makes sense because if there's active disease that's causing you to be in a wheelchair and you could improve, that's not quite the same as having long-standing significant disability. The other thing they mention is no evidence of non-relapsing progressive multiple sclerosis. So in general, we believe disease-modifying therapies are more effective in relapsing MS, though there is evidence in progressive multiple sclerosis. For instance, Ocrevus and rituximab have been studied in primary progressive MS, the Olympus and Oratorio trials, respectively. Mazent has been studied successfully in secondary progressive MS. Though it is true, if you look at the actual participants, participants in these trials, many of them did have relapses and did have active lesions, so it's difficult to say for sure they would work in people with non-relapsing progressive multiple sclerosis, and they go on to define this term shortly. For switching disease-modifying therapy, they propose if there's no reduction in the frequency or severity of attacks after six months, you should switch medications, that makes a lot of sense, or if you have intolerable adverse effects or side effects, again, that makes a a lot of sense. In terms of stopping disease modifying therapy, they again mention if you develop the inability to walk or achieve an EDSS of 7.0, meaning that you require a wheelchair. Again, I wouldn't necessarily agree with this. It, of course, there isn't good evidence that medications work in people who use wheelchairs simply because they tend to be excluded from clinical trials, but that doesn't necessarily mean they wouldn't work for anyone. Of course, they're trying to be very evidence-based and err on the side of being conservative, I suppose. They also mention if someone has confirmed secondary progressive disease with an observable increase in disability for more than a 12-month period in the absence of relapse activity. And they also say secondary progressive disease would usually be diagnosed 
only in patients with an EDSS of 6.0 or greater. Now, the last sentence is just completely untrue. Progression in multiple sclerosis simply refers to an insidious decline in symptoms and has nothing to do with the current level of disability. For instance, if you used to be able to walk five miles, but your legs are getting slightly weaker over time, and you could only walk three miles, and then two miles, and then one mile, and this change is insidious, that's the definition of progression, even though you don't use a cane so your EDSS is still less than six. In that particular example, it could easily be around 4.0. So I don't agree with that at all. The first part, I would say that this would apply to a very high percentage of people with progressive disease because the rate of relapses and new MRI lesions decreases with progressive multiple sclerosis. So particularly at the time of transition to secondary progressive MS, a lot of people are gonna meet these criteria so they're essentially saying they're going to stop disease-modifying therapy in a very large percentage of people who develop progressive MS. And while it's true that these medications may be less effective in progressive MS, they're not necessarily completely ineffective, particularly in transitional MS or younger people with progressive MS or people with progressive MS who have active lesions on MRI. They do mention they could potentially restart medication at a later time, like if someone has a relapse or new MRI lesions, but then arguably you're beyond, behind the eight ball. I'd like to know what people think about this particular recommendation. Obviously, it's highly controversial. They also talk about what treatments to avoid avoid because they're not evidence-based. They say that corticosteroids, these are steroids like prednisone and methylprednisolone or solumedrol, and plasma exchange have roles in the treatment of acute relapses of MS, but do not have long-term disease-modifying efficacy. One of the old-school popular treatments of MS was pulse steroids, like giving one gram of IV methylprednisolone or solumedrol IV once a month, and this really does not have good evidence, and I do have one patient who received this treatment who had a very significant side effect of osteonecrosis of the hip, and and that ended up being worse than their neurological problems related to MS. So be very careful looking for aggressive treatment. Intermittent plasmapheresis also has been used, but it really has no evidence one way or the other. Of course, plasmapheresis or plasma exchange is effective in people who have a relapse that is not responsive to steroids. They also say that intravenous immunoglobin has, or IVIG, has no place in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. In fact, there are class one studies showing that it's completely ineffective, so I do agree with this. IVIG has been used to treat low immunoglobins in people with MS who have been treated with B-cell depleting drugs such as rituximab, ocrevus, or casimpta, but I really do agree with everything on this slide. Next, we move to the treatment algorithm for different scenarios, and we'll start with people who have a new diagnosis of MS, people who have never received any disease-modifying therapy. Now, they mention that people with a single clinical episode who do not have MRI findings suggestive of multiple sclerosis should not be treated. Keep in mind that multiple sclerosis is multiple. If you have optic neuritis, but the MRI of your brain is normal, you probably don't have multiple sclerosis. But I've seen many people inappropriately treated, even for years, sometimes with very risky medications. So always keep in mind the principle of accurate diagnosis. Now, for people who have multiple sclerosis and they're newly diagnosed, perhaps with a single episode, they could be treated with interferon beta. These are medications such as Avenix, Rebif, Beta Ceron, Extavia, or Glatiramer Acetate, such as Copaxone or Glatopa. So these are older, safe, but relatively low efficacy injectable drugs, or according to the NHS, could be treated with Lemtrada or Ocrevus, so stronger medications. So you could use really weak medications or very strong medications. Now you can see under note three, they say under exceptional circumstances, markers indicated a poor prognosis for rapidly developing permanent disability. Lemtrada or Ocrevus can be used. In other words, they generally favor the weaker agents and only under exceptional circumstances could you use a stronger medication. Now, I really strongly disagree with this and I'll tell you why. 
it is true that there are some prognostic markers in multiple sclerosis. For instance, if you have a severe attack with poor recovery, or you have multiple early attacks close together with a short duration between attacks, or if you have a lot of spinal cord lesions or spinal cord atrophy or numerous gadolinium enhancing lesions, if your first attack involves the spinal cord or brainstem and causes symptoms such as weakness or sphincter symptoms like incontinence or dizziness, vertigo, difficulty swallowing, rather than optic neuritis, on the average, the prognosis is worse, but there's a tremendous amount of variability. We simply cannot accurately predict the prognosis of multiple sclerosis early on in the disease. That's just the reality. It's simply impossible. These are just average claims with huge, massive amounts of variation. And someone trying to tell a 20-year-old with optic neuritis or transverse myelitis who's newly diagnosed with MS what they're going to look like at age 50 or 60, I can tell you for certain they're completely making it up. There's simply no way to do that with current technology. Also, there's a lot of observational evidence that stronger medications early on are more effective. They mention here indicated a poor prognosis for rapidly developing permanent disability. Why does disability have to be rapidly developing? Many people who are, say, 20 years old with relapsing remitting MS, their probability of being in a wheelchair by age 30 is very, very low. But if you look at people with MS, say by age 40 or 50, a fairly significant percentage of them do have moderate problems. They may look good to a layperson, but they may have some subtle symptoms like difficulty walking long distances. They may have pain or fatigue or subtle cognitive problems. Many people may be on disability even if they look good. And I would say you don't need to just prevent severe, rapidly evolving permanent disability, but also slowly evolving moderate disability is definitely worth preventing. And of course, these medications have risk, but my general opinion is that in the long run, the risks are outweighed by the benefits for many, in fact, in my opinion, most people with newly diagnosed relapsing multiple sclerosis. There's actually very strong observational evidence to support this, just looking at people who receive stronger agents, they tend to do better on average. Of course, that could be highly confounded because certain types of people tend to seek out stronger medications. This is trying, try, we're trying to confirm this with two actual randomized trials called Treat MS and Deliver MS, and we may get results on those, or at least preliminary results, sometime soon. So this is one of my main disagreements with the treatment algorithm, and I suspect that Professor Giovannoni and others would agree with me, despite the fact that his name is on this algorithm. They also very briefly mentioned this phenomenon called clinically isolated syndrome, or CIS. And this is when someone has one attack of demyelinating disease, like optic neuritis or, or transverse myelitis or brainstem attack, but they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis. Now, the NHS says they're not really convinced by the treatment of clinically isolated syndrome, even though there actually is evidence of this. But I'll just say that because of changes in diagnostic criteria, the number of people with clinically isolated syndrome is smaller and smaller. Most people in those CIS clinical trials, now they would be considered to have multiple sclerosis anyway, so it doesn't really matter. This the next slide is for people with established relapsing or remitting MS, and they talk about different clinical scenarios. So this top section is for people who had two significant attacks in the last two years, and then people who had one relapse in the last two years and radiological activity, in other words, new MRI lesions, and this last category for people who have rapidly evolving multiple sclerosis. So for this first category, two attacks in the last two years, uh, they suggest you could use a lot of different medications, interferon beta, medications like Extavia or beta serum, dimethylfumarate, this is Tecfidera, glutarium or acetate, such as Copaxone, Abagio, Limtrata, or Ocrevus. So you could use a lot of different medications, and you can see note 7, they say Limtrata and Ocrevus should only be used when the patient and MS specialists accept the significant risks and burden of monitoring. Of course, I agree, you have to accept the risks of these medications if you're going to take them. 
They also mentioned that Tecfidera may be more effective than injectable medications and Abagio. So Tecfidera is probably better than interferons such as beta-seron or Extavia and Abagio and glutaramer acetate formulations such as Copaxone. So for this next category, these are people with one attack in the last two years and radiological activity. Somehow the list of medications is pared down. Now you should only get the injectables, interferon beta and glutaramer, or Lemtrada or Ocrevus. So somehow all of a sudden, Tecfidera and Abagio are not options. Is it really that different, someone who has two attacks in the last few years versus one attack and radiological activity? I can tell you, and I look at PubMed for new articles about MS most days of the week, and I've done this for several years, I assure you this is completely made up. There is zero evidence, and it seems incredibly arbitrary to me. Now this last category, rapidly evolving severe multiple sclerosis, they do recommend recommend stronger medications such as Lymtrada or Ocrevus, Cladribine, this is Mavenclad, or Tysabri. I, of course, do agree with the use of highly active disease-modifying therapies, especially in people with more significant relapsing MS. And I should mention the putative superiority of Tecfidera over first-line agents isn't entirely made up. There was a head-to-head -head trial of Tecfidera versus Copaxone, a glutiramor formulation, published the confirmed trial in 2012. Now, now, this wasn't an entirely a randomized double-blinded trial. They didn't have a double dummy for the glutiramer or copaxone simply because it's an injection. They wanted to make things easier. But you can see there is a trend. It's not statistically significant, but a trend towards superiority of Tecfidera over glutiramer with fewer relapses. They pulled people making the algorithm, and most of them thought Tecfidera was superior to first-line agents, not just copaxone, but other first first-line agents. They also asked if people thought that Tecfidera could be presented as a second-line agent. In other words, it could be used in people who failed medications such as Cobaxone, and it was split about 50-50. I personally would have said no. I think it's significantly less effective than medications such as Lemtrada, Tysabri, and Ocrevus, and probably also less effective than Gelenia or Fingolimod. Next, we move to what to do if you have poor tolerance of a first-line drug. So you take a medication, but you have bad side effects. It just doesn't work out. Now, a lot of this is not so controversial. Like, let's say you're taking a low-efficacy medication such as Extavia, but you get bad depression or uh, flu-like symptoms, why not change to Copaxone or Tecfidera? That's a very practical approach. But somehow the stronger medications, Lemtrada and Ucrevis, are no longer on the list, and that just doesn't make sense to me. Let's say someone had severe enough MS to be recommended to take Lemtrada, but they had a severe infusion reaction so they couldn't continue it. Why couldn't they be offered Ocrevus? It doesn't make sense to suddenly chicken out and not offer high efficacy disease modifying therapy just because someone has an unfortunate idiosyncratic bad tolerance of a single drug. These drugs have nothing to do with each other and are completely different from each other. Now for rapidly evolving severe MS, they do seem to recommend switching to another high efficacy medication with one exception. They've added Gelenia or fingolimod, which is generally speaking thought to be a moderately effective disease-modifying therapy. Note 10, they say, NHS England 2014 policy states that Gelenia can be used as an alternative to Tysabri for those receiving Tysabri who are at high risk of developing PML. This makes sense, but we have many other options now. It's time for an update. But what if it's not side effects that's the problem with the drug, but that it just didn't work? You had a relapse or develop new lesions while taking the medication. I think they give very practical advice. If you're taking a weaker medication, such as beta interferon, you could change to something stronger. If you're already on a stronger medication, you could change to a different medication with a different mechanism of action that may work better for you. Now, they admit for drugs like Lemtrada or Ocrevus or frankly, other highly effective disease-modifying therapies, if they don't work, there's not necessarily great evidence as to what you should do, but they do give some suggestions, and this is the specific algorithm for failed second-line therapy, and they break it down into any disease activity 
versus rapidly evolving severe MS, but it basically comes down to the same thing. You could consider just continuing with the medication if you don't think there are other alternatives that would be more effective where you're willing to take the risk. You could change to a different highly effective medication, or you could even consider hematopoietic stem cell transplant, though note 14 they mention only for relapsing MS and for people who are, quote, prepared to accept the significant risk of the procedure. Unfortunately, there isn't great evidence for hematopoietic stem cell transplant in people with progressive MS. They also mentioned that if you're switching from something else like Lemtrada to Tysabri, the risk of PML may be greater if you've previously taken an immunosuppressant. I definitely agree with that, particularly if you're JC virus antibody positive. You should also note that the index level, the sort of titer of the JC virus antibody, is not accurate if you've previously taken an immunosuppressant medication, and any positive value is very concerning. And one other random thing I should mention is in this document, they specifically mention a criteria for Lemtrada and say that someone should have two or more new MS lesions on MRI over a year. I really don't understand the use of this language over a year. Let's say someone has 20 gadolinium enhancing lesions on their initial MRI, would they not be a candidate for Lemtrada? Let's say someone is on a different medication and they have a severe devastating spinal cord attack, but with only one lesion in the spine, would they not be a candidate for Lemtrada? It just doesn't really make sense to me. But I'd love to have some feedback on this. What do you think about the criteria in general? What do you think is good? What do you think is bad? Please mention in the comments, particularly if you live in England, England, what are your experiences with the NHS in England? Is the care good? Is the care bad? What can they do to improve? And do you agree with this algorithm? I'll tell you straight out, I don't think this algorithm is good. I think it's extremely bad. I don't find it to be evidence-based at all. I think it's essentially completely made up just based on people's opinions. And frankly, I think a lot of the opinions are just wrong, especially the conservative use of low efficacy disease modifying therapies, just because someone does not meet certain very arbitrary criteria. In the long run, you know, I don't think this is going to lead to good results for a lot of people. Of course, I understand this is a government system. They have limited resources. They want to be evidence-based. They want to conserve resources so they can give treatment to everyone. I'm not even sure this is really going to save money because if you're not treating MS well, people will on the average have more disability, which may incur more problems and even more cost later on. So that's my personal opinion. Again, many very qualified people created this algorithm and things do change over time. But I'd love to know your opinion and let me know if you have suggestions for future videos.